indigenous land. So um, my plan tonight, uh, Roshi asked me to speak about my new novel, so I will certainly do that. Um, and I also thought it might be nice to, to read a little bit. Um, uh, one of the things I really miss about uh, not traveling, you know, about, about traveling is that I don't really get to, um, to read, to do readings out loud. And um, there's just something so special and fun about reading out loud, especially fiction. Um, it, it uh, I, I know that I always enjoy that when, when um, you know, when people read to me, uh, read stories to me. And um, so I'd like to just do a little bit about uh, of that. Um, the, the book, The Book of Form and Emptiness is a book about voices. Um, and so it seems uh, especially fitting to do a little reading so that you can hear some of the voices um, as well. And um, I also want to talk about uh, some of the elements, the, you know, the Buddhist elements and other elements um, that, that kind of constellated to uh, create this novel. Um, and perhaps uh, if I have time to share some thoughts about Zen as a creative practice um, and the relationship that I see between Zen and writing. And actually, maybe I'll, I'll start there. Um, I'd like to start by invoking um, a little of uh, my favorite of all time Buddhist writers, uh, Dogen Zenji, um, and his words about the study of Buddhism. And I'm sure this will be familiar uh, to everyone. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things of the world. When actualized by the myriad things, the body mind of self and the body mind of others drop away. No trace of realization remains and this no trace continues endlessly. So I, I really love this quote um, because it uh, seems to so perfectly describe the practice of Buddhism. Um, and it also uh, describes perfe perfectly uh, the practice of writing novels um, as well. And, um, and I think not just writing novels or any kind of writing, I think it really describes um, the act or the practice of um, any kind of creative act. Um, so I'd just like to kind of invoke that as a, as a place to start as I, uh, as I talk more about the Book of Form and Emptiness. Um, so first of all, the title. Um, I think that's traditional to always talk about the title first. Um, it, it's a little bit of a spoiler, right? Um, I, you probably all guessed that this book has um, something to do with Buddhism. Um, and as you all know, uh, the phrase form and emptiness comes from the Mahaprajnaparamita Shingyo or the Great Perfect Wisdom Heart Sutra. And, and these are the words we chant, right? Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is not different from emptiness, emptiness is not different from form. And um, I bring that up because um, the the way that um, Buddhism has started to um, sort of work its way into uh, my writing is something that, um, you know, that I, in other words, the, the way that Buddhism has started to integrate and, and um, manifest in the form of my writing, I think I should say, um, is, is something that I'd like to mention today. Um, this really started with A Tale for the Time Being. Um, and A Tale for the Time Being was a kind of an exploration of time, and in particular, uh, the Dogen fascicle uh, time being, or being time, can be translated so many ways. Um, and in the same way that A Tale for the Time Being was an exploration of time being, um, the Book of Form and Emptiness is a kind of an exploration of, um, of space and of matter. So. Um, I see the two books as being almost companions uh, to each other. Um, both books have uh, Zen Buddhist nuns in them. Um, one nun in A Tale for the Time Being is extremely old, um, and the nun in um, The Book of Form and Emptiness is quite a bit younger. 
Um, both books have, um, you know, explicitly Zen Buddhist themes um, or questions or koans um, at their heart. So as Keegan uh, described, um, the Book of Form and Emptiness is a book about, it's a story of um, a boy named Benny O who loses his father in a really um, stupid and tragic accident. And Benny is quite traumatized by this death. And in the aftermath, um, he starts to hear voices. Uh, so the first voice he hears is the voice of his father calling his name. And this happens at the crematorium as he's watching his father's um, body be burned. Um, later, uh, he starts to hear other voices as well. And these voices belong to the things in his house. Um, they're just sort of random things at first, you know, a Christmas ornament, a sneaker, um, uh, a piece of wilted lettuce. And um, the voices of the things seem to be speaking to him, uh, but he doesn't quite understand exactly what it is they're saying. Um, he understands the, the feeling tone though, and this is quite disturbing to him. And what makes it more disturbing is that his mother, Annabelle, um, who has started working from home, and I think this is something many of us um, are familiar with, um, she's working from home and has become a bit of a hoarder. Uh, so their house is quite chaotic, and as a result, it's filled with things um, that, that won't shut up. So the voices uh, follow Benny to school and they start making him act out and he gets in trouble with the school authorities and winds up on a pediatric uh, psych ward. Um, after he's discharged, um, he finds his way to uh, the local public library, um, which is of course um, a place, you know, library is a place filled with speaking things, right? Books speak to us after all, um, but at the library, um, they're orderly, you know, they're all, lined up neatly on their shelves and they speak in their quiet library voices. So he finds, um, Benny finds uh, quite a bit of solace at the library. Um, at the library, he meets a sort of group of people who are sort of the denizens of the library. Um, he meets a, a homeless uh, Slovenian poet philosopher who holds literary salons in the men's washroom. Um, he meets a beautiful young performance artist and falls in love with her. Um, and he meets uh, a very special talking object, um, his very own book, who starts narrating his life. And um, as, as uh, Keegan mentioned, the narrator of the Book of Form and Emptiness is the Book of Form and Emptiness. Um, and the book is in dialogue with uh, Benny and is quite literally speaking itself into existence, speaking itself and also speaking Benny um, into being. Um, and helping Benny uh, learn to listen to what uh, really matters. Um, so I thought um, I would read just a little bit, um, and I hope this is okay for every, with everyone, uh, just kind of get cozy and um, read a little bit from the beginning. In the beginning, a book must start somewhere. One brave letter must volunteer to go first, laying itself on the line in an act of faith from which a word takes heart and follows, drawing a sentence into its wake. From there, a paragraph amasses and soon a page and the book is on its way, finding a voice, calling itself into being. A book must start somewhere, and this one starts here. A boy. Shh, listen. That's my book, and it's talking to you. Can you hear it? It's okay if you can't, though. It's not your fault. Things speak all the time, but if your ears aren't attuned, you have to learn to listen. You can start by using your eyes, because eyes are easy. Look at all the things around you. What do you see? A book, obviously. And obviously the book is speaking to you. So try something more challenging. The chair you're sitting on, the pencil in your pocket, the sneaker on your foot. Still can't hear? Then get down on your knees and put your head to the seat or take off your shoe and hold it to your ear. No, wait, if there's people around, they'll think you're mad. So try it with the pencil first. 
Pencils have stories inside them, and they're safe as long as you don't stick the point in your ear. Just hold it next to your head and listen. Can you hear the wood whisper, the ghost of the pine, the mutter of lead? Sometimes it's more than one voice. Sometimes it's a whole chorus of voices rising from a single thing, especially if it's a made thing with lots of different makers, but don't be scared. I think it depends on the kind of day they were having back in Guangdong or Laos or wherever. And if it was a good day at the old sweatshop, if they were enjoying a pleasant thought at the moment when that particular grommet came tumbling down the line and passed through their fingers, then that pleasant thought will cling to the whole. Sometimes it's not so much a thought as a feeling, a nice warm feeling like love, for example, sunny and yellow. But when it's a sad feeling or an angry one that gets laced into your shoe, then you better watch out because that shoe might do crazy shit, like marching your feet right up to the front of the Nike store, for example, where you could wind up smashing the display window with a baseball bat made of furious wood. If that happens, it's still not your fault. Just apologize to the window and say I'm sorry to the glass, and whatever you do, don't try to explain. The arresting officer doesn't care about the crappy conditions in the bat factory. He won't care about the chainsaws or the sturdy ash tree that the bat used to be. So just keep your mouth shut. Stay calm. Be polite. Remember to breathe. It's really important not to get upset because then the voices will get the upper hand and take over your mind. Things are needy. They take up space. They want attention and they'll drive you mad if you let them. So just remember, you're like the air traffic controller. No, wait, you're like the leader of a big brass band made up of all the jazzy stuff of the planet. And you're floating out there in space, standing on this great garbage heap of a world with your hair slicked back and your natty suit and your stick up in the air, surrounded by all the eager things. And for one quick, beautiful moment, all their voices go silent, waiting till you bring your baton down. Music or madness, it's totally up to you. The book. So start with the voices then. When did he first hear them? When he was still little? Benny was always a small boy and slow to develop as though his cells were reluctant to multiply and take up space in the world. It seems he pretty much stopped growing when he turned 12, the same year his father died and his mother started putting on weight. The change was subtle, but Benny seemed to shrink as Annabelle grew, as if she were metabolizing her small son's grief along with her own. Yes, that seems right. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. And maybe we can come back to it again, uh, if we have time. Um, so the, the Book of Form and Emptiness uh, begins with a death. And um, this seems like an appropriate uh, way to start a book with this title. Uh, death suggests the movement from form into emptiness. Um, it's a mark of impermanence, one of the three marks of existence. And, and death causes suffering, the first noble truth. Um, and, and the book is really about the suffering caused by death and the way that Benny and Annabelle learned to come to terms with it. And um, I often draw from personal experience uh, when I'm writing fiction, and, and I think all fiction writers do. I, th I think the word fiction is actually a misnomer um, or it's a sort of shield, you know, it's a force field that we can put up, fiction writers can put up um, to protect us from, you know, being accused of, of what, you know, drawing from our own experience, um, being seen into, right? Um, and this really reminds me too of, of Dogen's uh, Genjo Koan, the opening of Genjo Koan, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. You know, to be a fiction writer is to study the self. And, um, and I bring this up because uh, one of the factors that inspired this book was um, the death of my own father. Um, and uh, after my dad died, um, this was back in 1998, uh, for about a year after he died, um, I used to hear his voice. Um, and it always happened when I was doing some 
pretty kind of random and inconsequential thing like you know folding the laundry or doing the dishes and you know i'd be doing this and and behind me and always to the right side um i, I would hear him um clear his throat right he always cleared his throat and um and then say my name ruth and um, this, this happened, oh gosh, maybe about uh, four or five times. And every time it happened, I would, you know, I'd, I'd hear that and I'd whip around, you know, it, just to look for him, um, expecting to see him. And of course he wouldn't be there. And, um, and, you know, when that happened, every time that happened, I would feel that same, you know, sort of hit of loss and grief. So it was almost like, um, it was almost like a, a reminder right, of, of uh, this feeling. And it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a bad thing. Um, I always felt, uh, I always felt somehow comforted by this. Um, but then after about a year or so, it, it stopped happening. And, um, and I kind of forgot about it. It always happened very quickly. And I just kind of forgot about it. Um, but when I started um, thinking about this book, um, this seemed like an experience that I could give to Benny. Um, and so that's exactly what happens. Benny hears his voice, um, and then he starts to hear the voices of um, other things as well. Um, and so I was really thinking about, you know, what does it mean to hear voices, right? What, what does it mean to hear voices? Um, and as a, as a novelist, of course, this is a, uh, you know, a question that I grapple with a lot. Um, I always, um, you know, I always experience um, a novel coming to me as a voice. Right. Um, and very often that's the voice of a character. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, the voice of the, the book itself in this case. Um, and it's an, you know, it's an unshared experience, you know, just like the voice of my father when he was calling me. Nobody else could hear it. Right. Um, and I remember that um, I was at a, um, I was giving a talk and um, about, about exactly this, about, you know, the experience of writing. And um, one of the audience members uh, raised his hand. He was a middle-aged man and he raised his hand. And he asked me, you know, when, you know, when you speak about hearing voices, do you, you know, do you hear them as if with your ear, as if they're outside you? Or is it more an internal thing? You know, do you hear them sort of, you know, inside your head uh, with your mind? And, um, and, and he explained to me that his son, uh, the reason he was asking was because his son heard voices as if with his ear, as if the voices were outside him. And the voices were very harsh and they were very cruel. And this was a very disturbing um, situation. It's very disturbing um, to his son. And, um, and this really got me thinking because, um, you know, and I, I explained to him that, you know, with, um, you know, when I'm when I'm writing, it's more of an internal experience. I'm hearing the voices as if with my mind, and it's inside. Um, but that I'm also aware of and and very familiar with the kinds of harsh voices, the cruel voices, um, because I have a myriad of those as well, and I think we all do, right? The voices of the you know the internal critics and the judges and the editors, you know, who are. Um, you know, telling us that whatever it is that we're doing is no good, right? Um, and so I'm very familiar with those voices as well. And, um, and then I'm also familiar though with, you know, the voice that, you know, an external voice, um, you know, that, that uh, this father described his son um, hearing. And it occurred to me then that, um, you know, that, that voice hearing, um, this experience of hearing voices um, is a kind of a spectrum. Right, and on one hand, um, we have the you know the voices that are seen as um, sort of inspiration, the voices that are prized. You know, we're lucky enough to live in a culture that um, you know that that prizes um, and and um, uh, yeah, that prizes you know that kind of creativity, calls it inspiration, calls it the muse. You know, um, speaking to us, um, and and so those voices you know are sort of on one end of the spectrum, and then we have the kind of middle ground of, of, you know, the voices that tell us we should be doing this or we shouldn't be doing that. And, um, and sometimes these can get quite vicious. And, um, and those voices uh, seem to be kind of living in a, you know, sort of neurotic realm, right. Um, and then on the other um, end, we have the voices that, you know, if you uh, tell a psychiatrist, um, you know, that you are hearing 
these voices, um, you will probably uh, you know, be diagnosed with some form of psychosis, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, something like that. And so there's really this, you know, this spectrum of uh, experiences, right? And, um, and it occurred to me that, you know, that, that in our culture, our um, definition of what's normal right, is, is very norm, is very narrow, right? And we, um, you know, we, we forget that normal is a cultural construct, right? It's, it's something that we made up, we made up what normal is. Um, and in other cultures, um, you know, hearing voices as if outside uh, would be the mark of a great gift, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, shamans hear voices. I mean, for that matter, um, you know, Joan of Arc heard voices, um, uh, Sigmund Freud and um, and Carl Jung, the you know the the quote fathers of modern psychology, also heard voices, right? Um, and and some voices are you know that that people hear as if with their ears, as if outside. These unshared experiences um, are not uh, disturbing at all. So why is it then that we can't take this definition of normal and expand it, right? Expand it to include um, all of us. So this was something that I was uh, very much thinking um, as I was approaching um, and as I was doing the writing of, of, um, of the Book of Form and Emptiness. Um, I was also thinking um, a lot about um, uh, objects, things, right? And, um, and of course that kind of led me to, uh, you know, the koan that was at the heart of, of this book. Um, you know, I think I, all of my novels seem to have some kind of question or, you know, uh, problem or, you know, some kind of koan at the, the center of them. Um, in my first two novels, you know, I was sort of pondering the questions of authenticity and identity um, and representation. Um, in A Tale for the Time Being, I was pondering this notion of time being, uh, Dogen's fascicle. And, and for A Tale for the Time Being, it was this question of, um, you know, do insentient beings speak the Dharma? Okay. Um, and so the, the book is, I think, uh, in part, um, my effort, um, my attempt to better understand this question. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I think all books kind of grow out of that, uh, you know, for me, novels are the way that I sort of grapple with these kinds of existential questions. Um, and, and that's fine, you know, as a, as a writer, as a novelist, you know, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, you know, but as a, a Zen practitioner, um, at first anyway, um, I, I really used to think this was a problem. Um, you know, as, as you all know, you know, Buddhism has a, a long, well, Zen has a long, um, you know, tradition of uh, textual commentary on teachings, right? And, and, um, and this is especially true of the koans. You know, koan literature starts out with one story and then someone comments on the story and then someone else comments on the comments on the story, right? And so it's kind of this, um, you know, this proliferation of language of words, right? Um, which is funny because of course in Zen, you know, Zen also has the reputation um, for eschewing words and letters, right? In favor of uh, direct insight. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'm thinking here of, uh, of Bodhidharma, you know, the first Zen ancestor, and the verse that it was um, attributed to him. Uh, Zen is a special transmission outside the scriptures, not founded on words or letters. Um, by pointing directly to one's mind, one sees, uh, lets one see um, one's own true nature and thus attain Buddhahood. Okay. Um, and, and of course, what's funny about this too, is that um, this whole story about Bodhidharma, you know, quoting this verse or, or you know, being, um, you know, the author of this verse, um, that apparently is a fiction as well. So, you know, here again, we have sort of fictions within fictions. Um, the, the verse was apparently written um, several centuries after Bodhidharma had, had died. And, and I think there's questions about, you know, um, how real any of the legends of Bodhidharma um, really are. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, I go back to this, this idea that I had a, you know, sort of problem with um, investigating uh, these Buddhist ideas through the vehicle of fiction. Um, and 
Um, but I was always sort of consoled by, uh, by Dogen, again, my favorite um, Zen master, um, who really did not see words and letters as being separate from direct experience, right? Um, reading and writing is its own kind of direct experience. Um, and, you know, in the same way that fish swim in the sea and birds fly in the air, you know, we um, humans kind of wallow about in, in words and letters and language. Um, and so this is my, um, this is my consolation, you know, for, um, for this, this, uh, this method of practice that I have. Um, and um, I, I've really come to see the, um, you know, the, the novels as being almost a, a contemporary expression of this um, tradition of commentary literature. Um, and, you know, I guess also if, if they're not that, then it can't be helped. I mean, I, I do it anyway. Um, so to kind of take it back to this question of, uh, you know, do insentient beings um, speak the Dharma? Um, the, the question is interesting to me um, because as an environmentalist, of course, I, um, you know, and somebody who's, you know, really worried about the future of the planet, um, these questions are, you know, could not be more pertinent, right? Um, can insentient beings be our teachers, right? Um, can the earth, can grasses and trees, you know, walls and tiles and pebbles um, teach us about um, the nature of existence, right? Um, you know, can the myriad things of the world that Dogen talks about, can they enlighten us? Um, and this includes pieces of wilted lettuce and sneakers and pencils, right? Um, and I think that, you know, in Zen, of course, the, the short answer um, is yes, they can. Um, uh, here I'm thinking about the, I think it was, a, I think it's a flower ornament sutra. Um, the earth expounds the Dharma, living beings expound the Dharma, everything expounds the Dharma. Um, and so this, you know, the investigation of this question um, was what I sort of embarked on as I was, uh, as I was writing this book. And um, I uh, started reading, um, in particular, uh, Taigen Dan Layton's um, book. Um, it's a wonderful book called um, Just This Is It, uh, Dongshan and the Practice of Suchness. And, um, you know, this the, the sort of make a long story, a long story short. Um, but, you know, Dongshan, of course, is one of our most venerated Soto Zen ancestors. And um, he was preoccupied by this question, you know, if, if insentient beings speak the Dharma, who is able to hear this Dharma, right? And he searches out various teachers and eventually um, someone tells him to take his question um, to Yunyang, who became his teacher. And, um, and he finally tracks down Yunyang and they have this exchange, right? Who is able, to hear the Dharma expounded by insentient beings. And Yun Yang answers, uh, non-sentient beings are able to hear it. And uh, Dong Shang says, you know, can you hear it? And Yun Yang says, yes, I can. And then Dong Shang says, well, why can't I hear it? And Yun Yang waves his fly whisk and says, can you hear it now? Right. And, and actually this conversation that they had goes on a while, but, um, and, and it differs depending on the version of the story. Once again, you know, many versions of the story, which one is real. Um, but finally, Dongshan in the end, you know, gets it and he composes this verse. Um, how marvelous, how marvelous. The Dharma expounded by non-sentient beings is inconceivable. Listening with your eyes, no, sorry, listening with your ears, no sound, hearing with your eyes, you directly understand, right? And, and I, uh, that too was, you know, the, the sort of synesthesia that that implies was, was very interesting to me. And, and so that kind of worked its way um, into the novel as well. And, um, and I was also thinking about, uh, I was also reading Dogen Zenji's commentary on the Dongsheng story um, in his uh, essay, his fascicle, um, Mujo, Mujo Seppo, um, which is in sentient beings speak the Dharma. And, um, and, and Dogen writes, um, in sentient beings hearing in sentient beings speak the Dharma is essentially all Buddhas hearing all Buddhas speak the Dharma. So there's no separation between non-sentient beings and Buddhas, right? There's no separation between uh, the myriad things and us. 
So again, you know, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things of the world. So I was thinking a lot about our relationship with objects, with things, with our possessions, right? And, um, and here is where, again, um, I sort of turned inward and, um, and started thinking about my own history, you know, and where I learned to uh, relate to things in the way that I, um, that I have. And, um, you know, my, my parents were um, uh, born in 1914, um, and they, they grew up during the Great Depression. And, um, you know, they were, they were very, very thrifty people, right? Um, they never threw anything out if they could afford, if they could, you know, avoid it. Um, you know, uh, even things like, you know, saran wrap, plastic wrap and tin foil, you know, they, they would wash, you know, very carefully and, and hang up, well, hang up and dry it and then fold it, you know, and put it someplace where it could be reused, right? And, um, I remember when I was, uh, you know, cleaning out their house after they died, um, you know, I was dealing with all of these, you know, these things, these, you know, rubber bands and pieces of tin foil and plastic wrap. And um, I came to this one, um, I, I found this one little box that was in my mom's room, right? And um, it, <laughs> it uh, was labeled in her handwriting, you know, she had written very carefully um, in both English and Japanese right? Empty box, karabako, right? Empty box, karabako. And, um, you know, and this was like completely perplexing to me because what do I do with this box, right? I can't, um, I can't put anything in it because by putting anything in it, it turns it into exactly what it's not, right? And so, you know, this was the kind of conundrum that I was facing, um, you know, sort of constantly as I was, uh, as I was trying to um, empty their house in order to sell it after their death. Um, and the other thing too is that you know my my mom was a um, uh, my mom was Japanese. My dad was an um, an anthropologist. He had all of these things, you know these these. Um, he worked with the Oneida people um, in Wisconsin and upstate New York, and he had all these gifts that had been given to him over the years. He was an honorary member of the tribe and had received all of these gifts, right? And they were these beautiful special. Um, in, in, uh, objects, Oneida objects, um, and I had no idea what they were. Um, my mom's things were from Japan, she's Japanese. Um, and I remember, for example, um, a box of polished stones that she had um, that had been cut thin and polished and mounted to cards, right? And I used to, I used to um, play with these stones when I was little. And, um, and only at the end of her life did I learn that these stones had belonged to my grandfather and that he had um, collected them in uh, the New, Mexican, New Mexico desert um, when he was um, interned in a Justice Department camp um, in Santa Fe. And apparently they had a, um, a sort of stone polishing um, equipment and he would go out into the desert um, in, you know, in the confines of you know, the, the barbed wire and he would find these stones and bring them back and slice them and polish them. And, and so you know, this was an example of um, these objects that uh, were you know, beautiful and mysterious to me as I was growing up. Um, and in this case, I knew what the story was, but you know, for most of the objects that I found, most of the stuff in the house, I had no idea what the story was and you know, what all of their stories were. And I remember thinking, you know, um, if only these objects could, you know, could speak, if only they could talk to me, um, you know, then I, I would know what they said. Um, so again, this is the, you know, another um, sort of one of the elements, I think, that, that came into, um, uh, you know, that, that came into this kind of constellating mass um, as I was writing the book. And, um, and it, this is, I think, what really got me very interested in this idea of, um, you know, of uh, things speaking, what they could tell us if they could only speak. Um, and so, you know, one of Annabelle's, uh, the, Benny's mother's problems is that um, when her husband Kenji dies, um, she can't throw anything away that belonged to him, right? Everything that, um, that he owned was imbued somehow with 
story with, um, you know, with, you know, his clothes still smell like him, right? His flannel shirts, um, you know, smell, he was a musician, right? A jazz musician, his flannel shirt smelled like, um, you know, like whiskey and, um, and cigarettes, right? She, she couldn't, she couldn't throw anything out. Um, and, and so this, of course, kind of brought me around to, um, to thinking about, you know, Marie Kondo, right? Um, and, uh, you know, certainly when I was trying to, you know, clean out my parents' house as well, you know, this, this idea of clutter and tidying, you know, this, this became kind of a preoccupation. Um, and, you know, I was really, so when, you know, when Marie Kondo sort of arrived on the scene in, you know, in, in America, and, and actually this was, you know, the beginning of her sort of campaign for, you know, world domination, um, I, I was really, uh, you know, fascinated by the kinds of things that she was teaching, um, because there was something in her teaching that I recognized. Um, it, it seemed to me to be, uh, you know, there was there was a kind of an attitude of respect um, towards objects, right? That she was trying to teach um, Westerners, right? And so when she was, um, you know, so for example, um, you know, if you have a pair of socks that have holes in them, right? Um, these socks have, you know, literally worn themselves out taking care of your feet and keeping your feet warm. Um, then you don't just throw them out, right? You you um, you know you you take a moment and you hold them and you look at them and you you know feel this you know feeling of gratitude right and then you throw them out okay so it's just this little extra step that um you know that that uh teaches you to have respect for the things around you right the things around us um, and of course, you know, Marie Kondo comes from a uh, Shinto tradition, but um, in, in, you know, our Zen tradition as well, um, we, we treat things with respect. When we pick up a teacup, we hold it with two hands, right? Because one hand is, is kind of casual and um, it, it doesn't really show proper respect for the teacup, right? Um, there's this um, a wonderful tradition in Japan, uh, and it, it's Shinto in origin, but um, sometimes it's, it's um, carried out at Buddhist temples as well, um, where uh, it's, it's a ceremony for broken needles and pins, right? And when you think about the history of, you know, in the olden days, right, uh, a needle or a pin was handmade. And so it was a very, you know, very precious object. And you would use it, you know, to, to sew kimono and, um, you know, to, to make clothes for your family. And eventually the needle would break. And um, when the needle broke, you wouldn't just throw it out, right? Because that would be, again, disrespectful. Um, so you'd keep it. And then once a year um, at the local shrine or, or temple, um, there would be a special uh, memorial service day for broken needles and pins. And you would bring your needle um, to the shrine and on the shrine's altar, there'd be a block of tofu, right? Um, and, and so you'd take your broken needle and you'd put it into the tofu um, so that your needle would have a, um, a soft resting place, right? And then, um, you know, at the end of the day, a ceremony would be, um, would be held um, so that everyone could feel the appropriate gratitude towards these tools that had um, sort of, you know, worn themselves out in, um, helping us. Um, and of course, you know, too, there's a kind of, the other side to that is that um, needles and pins are, are sharp. Right, they're pointed, they're sharp, um, and they could hurt you. Um, so you you don't want to piss them off, right? You want to make sure that they end their life in a in a comfortable way, right? Um, so it's a little bit of insurance there. Um, and so, you know, this was you know this kind of teaching is so much a part of uh, you know of Japanese culture, um, and I thought it was really quite wonderful that Marie Kondo was trying to bring these traditions and bring this attitude of respect uh, you know, to the rest of the world. Um, and so I very much felt that, um, you know, that, that I wanted in, in the Book of Form and Emptiness to have um, a Zen nun um, who, like Marie Kondo, um, had written a book about tidying and about cleaning um, that, that became a kind of global bestseller. Um, and so uh, this character is, um, is in the book as well. Um, so let's see, I was hoping that um, I would have time to uh, read a little bit more, but I think I've, I think I've run, out of, um, run out of time there. Um, but the, 
the last thing I, I'd like to just mention is, um, is this idea of, um, of dialogue, right? Um, and I'm thinking here of um, the, you know, the, the teaching um, only a Buddha and a Buddha, right? That, that um, you know, that there's no enlightenment alone, right? That we are all, um, you know, deeply and intrinsically um, interconnected, right? And um, this is another, um, you know, another part of writing that is, um, you know, is very wonderful to me. Um, I, you know, we think about books as being um, sort of singular objects, individual objects, right? So the book of form and emptiness is this, right? This is the book of form and emptiness. Um, we think of it as, you know, a singular object that is kind of unchanging. And, and I really um, don't buy that at all. Um, I, I really think of books as being more like um, a collaboration um, in other words, it's not a, it's not, and it's not a single object, right? Um, it's more like an array of objects. Um, and this array is created by, you know, the writer um, who does her part, right? But then sends the book out into the world, right? Where it's picked up and read by, you know, hopefully, <laughs> uh, you know, many, many people. Um, and each time a reader brings um, their own lived experience to the book, right, to this object, then it becomes, a, you know, a process of co-creation, right? It becomes a collaboration and an entirely different book of form and emptiness is born. One that I'll never know about necessarily, but the, you know, each reader will have uh, made their own version, right, of the book of form and emptiness. And, and so that means that um, as long as books are being read, they're alive, right? They're living, they're living, things, right? Um, and and um, this is one of the reasons why I think that I um, always write from multiple points of view, because I don't really, you know, it, it only a Buddha and a Buddha, right, can, can tell this story, right? And so in this case, in the case of um, the Book of Form and Emptiness, the dialogue is between Benny and his book, Right. And they are co-creating, literally co-creating um, each other. And, you know, my, uh, you know, my feeling of, you know, extreme gratitude here is that, you know, I can send um, my book out into the world, right, and, um, and work with and collaborate with, um, with, you know, many, many different readers in order to, uh, you know, to create something that's brand new. Um, so, uh, I guess on that note, I will end and, um, say that, uh, I hope you, I hope you do read the book. And if you do read the book, then, um, please, you know, feel free to write to me and, um, and, uh, tell me a little bit about the book that we have, uh, created together. So thank you, uh, Roshi Joan for inviting me and, uh, thank you all for being here. <laughs>